Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the latest in Free Mind seminar uh, webinars: uh, non-dilutive funding for preclinical stage R and D. Uh, looks like we got a pretty good turnout here. I see we got people in from uh, all around the world. So I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for, for joining uh, and for participating in this webinar. Uh, we're going to focus on, as, as we do in Fremont, we're going to focus on non-dilutive funding from U.S. sources, uh, focus on uh, various opportunities. Good part of them, probably the majority of them, are from the NIH, the National Institute of Health, but there's also plenty of opportunities from the DOD, Department of Defense, uh, as well as, as many other opportunities uh, out there from uh, all the various uh, government agencies and institutes. We'll even touch upon a few uh, non-for-profit non uh, organizations or private foundations. Uh, my name is Stuart Jacobowitz, uh, Director of Business Development here uh, at Freemind, and uh, like I said, I'm happy to have you all here. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about Freemind, uh, please visit our web website. You can see it. The link is on the bottom of your slide. Uh, you can also uh, follow us on, on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, and you can catch uh, all of our webinars, this one included, which will be posted up uh, after, uh, after today's webinar is over, will be posted on uh, YouTube. So you can catch this and on all of them on, uh, on YouTube. So uh, let's get started. A little bit about Freemind. Uh, we've been around now a little over 17 years. Uh, we have currently 55 full-time employees. And we work with clients from around the world, whether uh, academics, university medical centers, independent research institutes. We work with uh, companies, both small and large, uh, from small startups, one or two people just started, just incorporated, still working out of their living room. Some of them prefer to work out of their kitchen, but, you know, that's their choice. Uh, from small, medium size, and on to uh, large size, even some of the large pharmaceuticals. Uh, we've worked in the past with some of the big names. Uh, J&J, Eli Lilly, AstraZeneca, you may have heard of them, um, I assume you did. Uh, and we submit on behalf of our clients anywhere between 400 and 450 grand applications every year. So it's a great deal of, of knowledge and experience uh, and expertise that we've built up over all these years and, and we put that to work for each and every grant application we, we work on uh, and for each and every client uh, that we work with. Our, our goal, our, our focus is to maximize your funding potential. We want to make sure you get as much money as possible from non-dilutive sources. And the way we do this is once we start working together, we, we get to understand our analysts more, more specifically. They're all PhDs, a great deal of, of scientific knowledge and non-dilutive funding experience. They, they get to know and understand all about your projects. Uh, your pipeline of projects, your funding needs, both near-term and long-term. And based on that, they go and they scour uh, the entire landscape of non-dilutive funding opportunities. Uh, and, and they create what we like to call a multi-submission granting strategy. We, we know from our experience that the way to maximize your chance for success is to submit as many grant applications as possible. Once we have the strategy in place, then we work together with you to, to maximize and then try to do as much as possible uh, to increase the chances of that the application will be success, successful and, uh, and will be awarded. We manage the whole production process uh, of, of uh, creating and writing this, this grant applications. Um, we lead the, the, the process of writing it, and when I say lead, it's important to understand that, that we do need you involved. You guys are the experts, so we do need you involved, but, but we take the lead, uh, the lead role here. And then when we're dealing with, uh, with contracts, we, of course, uh, uh, help uh, with the contract negotiations. So we, we believe, and we've seen time and time again, that non dilutive funding is really a strategic financial tool. It's not something nice, oh, you know, hey, it'd be good, we get it, but aside from the money, the validation of all, so it's really a strategic financial tool that really should be part of, of every uh, entity's um, toolbox. We're talking about a, a, a pool of money uh, from U.S. sources, about $50 billion. Yeah, that's correct. Not a typo. It's a B up there. $50 billion that's allocated every year uh, for non-delivered funding. Um, 
A big part of it, as you'll see soon, comes from the, uh, from the NIH, NIH has 27 institutes. Uh, we'll touch on some of them later, whether it's for cancer, for digestive disease, kidneys, uh, diabetes, neurological disorders, strokes, infectious disease, and on and on. Uh, 27 institutes, so they, they cover quite a, a great deal of, of, uh, of medical needs, as well as various populations. In addition to the NIH, there's also uh, other, BARDA, the FDA, the Center for Disease Control, National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, and all of their um, various DARPA, DITRA, uh, CDMRP, etc., uh, as well as uh, private foundations. So we, we try to, to work uh, with as many as possible with each client, wherever it's relevant, again, in order to maximize your chance for success. And we've seen, uh, and, and uh, we've seen it ourselves, and the Milken Institute study has, has shown us um, uh, independently, they've seen that for every dollar uh, that, that's invested, you know, people ask me, well, why does the uh, U.S. government go and fund uh, non-U.S. entities uh, and give them money uh, for grants? Why, what's, what's in it for them? So th this study shows that the, for every dollar that they invest, uh, the return on investment uh, is about $2.3, uh, and uh, so that, that's one way of looking at it from the U.S. side, but in addition, um, for, from your side, looking at it, for every dollar that you get uh, from uh, this funding, non diluted funding, from government funding, uh, it, it has shown to, to help attract over $8 uh, in private se sector funding. That's why we see it's really a strategic tool because um, often money uh, brings other money and certainly here uh, public non-dilutive funding, um, government funding helps with that as well. Uh, in, in addition, uh, another look and study uh, which, which is quite positive shows that 50% uh, of, of drugs that received FDA approval had received previously government funding. So. Um, you know, that's a that's a pretty good sign that, uh, and, and also a pretty good reason why you uh, why you really should try as much as possible to really focus uh, and dedicate the, the the appropriate resources to this very important uh, source of funding. So the NIH I mentioned before uh, is probably the biggest player in this in this arena. Uh, out of the fifty billion dollars, their budget. Uh, $50 billion or so from, from U.S. sources, the NIH uh, contributes about uh, 60%. Uh, or actually, you see here exactly this year's budget 2016 was $32.31 billion. You know, even though the hard times still went up uh, over a billion dollars this year. Um, and, sorry about that. And, um, out of this, actually, a good portion of this, um, about $27 billion, was uh, allocated to extramural uh, research. Sorry about that, the slide is not animating as it should. But a, a good chunk of that $27 billion, as I said, goes towards extramural research. Uh, so, um, so that's quite a lot of money that, that's out there for you guys to just, well, I wouldn't say pick off the ground, because you've got to work for it, but it, there's a lot of money out there uh, that, that could be very helpful. Where does, uh, where does the money go? So we see here a chart um, giving an idea of, of where it goes for genetics, uh, biotechnology, cancer, infectious disease, rare disease. Plenty of money spread out uh, to, to all different uh, illnesses and, and medical, uh, medical indications. We do know that, well, of course, clinical research is not, would not be included and in, in, uh, uh, clinical studies here. Uh, but in just about every other um, category here, a good chunk of that money, certainly many billions of dollars, is going towards preclinical uh, funding. So what are we talking about here? We know, actually you, probably, you guys probably know better than me, going through the, the process of, of uh, uh, development, whether it's drug development or uh, medical device, it's, it's a long, hard process. Uh, you got to go through the discovery, preclinical, etc. throughout. Uh, you see here that there's, there's money throughout the whole process. Whatever stage you're at, there is non-dilutive money that's, uh, that's uh, available for you. Uh, and that's really important for you to take, uh, to take note of, to try to do your best to take part of. 
But today, we're going to focus on this preclinical stage, this discovery and preclinical development stage, where we, we have monies coming from the NIH, whether it's from the R1s and R21s, whether it's SBIRs for, for small businesses, Phase 1, Phase 2, DOD, DITRA, DARPA, CDMRPs, and on. So we're talking about grants that average in size from, from $200,000 all the way up to uh, $2.5 million. So again, there, there's really a lot of money out there, and it really could help you financially as well as um, with future fundraising. Uh, it could really help you uh, grow and develop your, your company. So what are we talking about today? Our focus today is on preclinical funding. What is preclinical? So preclinical uh, definition I found is, is it's a stage of research that begins before clinical trials can begin, and during which important feasibility, iterative testing, and safety data are collected. So the main goals of when, it's, when we're talking about drug development, the main goals would be to determine a safe dose for first in man study. Uh, and assess uh, a product safety profile, but um, you know, in, in different other classes of products, um, there there are other uh, other uh, issues that have to be dealt with, whether it's a device, uh, gene therapy. So each one has its own specifics, but preclinical is is basically, and in short, before uh, before starting uh, clinical trials and the work you need to do in order so to enable you to start clinical trials. So what are some of the preclinical uh, mechanisms? So let's start off with the R21, a classic from the NIH. Uh, it supports high-risk exploratory and or developmental research applications that propose to investigate novel scientific ideas, model systems, tools, agents, targets, and technologies that have the potential to substantially move the field forward. The R21 does not need extensive background material or preliminary information, so that's really a good way to, to start off and you know, to get things going when you're really, really early stage. Uh, it can fund uh, up to two years of research uh, and a total funding of up to $275,000 uh, in direct costs. Um, and as we'll see soon, there's, there's another uh, component uh, for, for most of these grants, the indirect cost. But here we're talking about $275,000. Uh, but in one year, you can only get up to $200,000 uh, plus indirect costs. Uh, the, the second mechanism here we're looking at is the R01. Uh, this supports research applications that propose to investigate novel scientific ideas, model systems, tools, agents, targets, and technologies that have the potential to substantially move the field forward. They're really looking to, to make progress here. It is relevant, of course, for the preclinical, but it's also relevant um, for clinical stage R&D. The R01 is, is a bigger uh, grant, so it can fund for up to five years. Uh, it has an open budget of up to half a million dollars a year. So that totals up to two and a half million, up to two and a half million dollars um, over the five-year period, uh, plus indirect costs, and even and if you could get uh, approval, if you start early enough, uh, you could get approval, and sometimes you could even get more than the, the five hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, the deadlines for these uh, R ones and R twenty ones they they follow most of the time they follow the standard NIH cycle, uh, which is three times a year, uh, which is. June, October, and February. The next one's coming up in June. Uh, so the R01 is actually a couple of weeks away on June 5th, followed by the R21, which is June 16th. So if this is something you want to do, um, I, I suggest you finish listening to this webinar. I wouldn't want you to cut out early. Uh, but right afterwards, I think you should uh, get started right away. Um, now, an important thing to point out, because I know uh, we do have uh, some non-U.S. Um, entities here, uh, people with non-U.S. Uh, companies, entities, academics, um, listening in and participating. So most of the R01s and R21s, um, you're eligible. Foreign, uh, foreign organizations are eligible for. And something for everybody to, to, to hear is that virtual companies are eligible as well for these uh, R01s and R21s. Next, we have SBIRs and STTRs. 
Now, unlike the others, this is specifically for uh, U.S. small businesses. This is a congressionally mandated set-aside program that was established to strengthen the role of innovative small American businesses using federally funded uh, R&D money. Uh, so while the SBRs and SDTRs do have some similar goals, their objectives differ in that SBRs are intended to increase private sector commercialization of innovations derived from federally funded R&D, while SDTRs are intended to stimulate a partnership of ideas and technologies between innovative small businesses and nonprofit research institutions, again, using this uh, federal money. So they're, they're, they have similarities, but they do have their differences uh, also. And like I said, these are only for domestic uh, or, or U.S. small businesses. Uh, and they're looking to fund R&D, which has the potential for commercialization. So that's an important part of the program. Now, in addition to these three uh, mechanisms, we also do have two more here. The CDMRPs, Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. As you'll see, the, these agencies do like uh, acronyms. So CDMRPs. Um, or, as I said, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. Uh, their mission is to eradicate diseases and support the warfighter. Now, this uh, mechanism evolved um, uh, as a way for Congress to appropriate funds for research on specific diseases, specific diseases which have relevance to the healthcare needs of the military service members, veterans, and beneficiaries. And because of that, they do fund you know, people think Department of Defense, they're just going to be funding either soldiers' health uh, or weapons or things like that. But they do fund because they do have to uh, take care of uh, the, the millions of veterans and their beneficiaries and beneficiaries of, of active soldiers. So they do uh, offer and provide a lot of funding in many, many different, uh, many, many different areas. Uh, it's uh, th this is a, a program that has specific indications, uh, and the focus uh, changes every year. The review process is similar uh, to the NIH, uh, and here though, not though, or here, uh, I'm sure all, all of you will have to hear, non-U.S. entities are also eligible. But I don't want to get into too much detail about this, uh, because uh, not long ago, one of my uh, very capable colleagues uh, conducted a, a wonderful webinar on CDMRPs, so if you look up uh, on our uh, channel, Free Mind Consultants channel on YouTube, you could look up and see and get all the information uh, about CDMRPs, uh, which you see on YouTube, or if you want, you could look to our website and get their uh, get information on how to get to these videos as well. And the last mechanism that we're going to talk about right now uh, for preclinical is the BAAs, or the Broad Agency Announcements. Now, these are either highly specific solicitations uh, for certain areas of interest, such as, for example, the U.S. Army has used BAAs. Uh, they have different topics, which could range, range from uh, PTSD uh, to traumatic brain injury and all, all sorts of others. Or they could be very broad and generic, looking for ideas of interest uh, in something as broad as, as infectious uh, disease. So these are some of the, uh, the indication, the me mechanism, excuse me, that, that we are, uh, that we're going to look at. Now, it would not be complete if we just looked at, at specific uh, solicitations. Uh, so we do need to spend a couple of minutes uh, speaking about uh, omnibus solicitations, also known as parent announcements or investigator-initiated solicitations. Uh, these are basically very broad and very general uh, announcements looking for uh, interesting science. Uh, and uh, we see here there's a parent announcement for the R21, which is the Exploratory, Exploratory Developmental Grant. Uh, and this, like it says, it supports this Exploratory Developmental Research Projects for early and conceptual stages of these projects. Most of the NIH institutes participate in this, in this omnibus solicitation, uh, and, and it's really a, a, a great opportunity. Uh, whether you can, can or cannot find uh, other more specific solicitations is really a wonderful opportunity uh, that, that, uh, that you should certainly take, uh, take advantage of here. 
Uh, and as you see, uh, like the other R21s, it's uh, funding up 275000 up to $275,000 for up to two years, plus uh, indirect uh, cost, which could uh, go all the way up to 40%. Some even have got get more than that, but 40% uh, is a reasonable number. And then you have the, the R01s. Uh, the parent R01 supports a discrete speci specified circumscribed project in areas representing specific interests and competencies of the investigators. Uh, must be related to programmatic interest of one or more of the participating NIH institutes uh, or centers uh, and based on their scientific mission. In other words, in other words you're looking for um, um, all of the different uh, institutes that participate, you, you want to make sure that you submit uh, to the correct institute. And here, like we said before, funding of up to half a million dollars a year for up to five years plus, uh, plus in the indirect costs. And like I said, uh, even if, if, if you can find a solicitation which exactly fits your project, but even if you can, these are excellent solicitations uh, and they really should be considered as part of every non-dilutive funding strategy. And as you see here, uh, these two, just like the other R01s, R21s I mentioned, next deadline is June 5th and 16th, followed by October uh, and, and February deadlines. Uh, and then there's the SBIR, uh, Omnibus or Parent uh, uh, Solicitation. Uh, again, uh, wonderful solicitations and, uh, and, and really, uh, if you qualify, it's really, uh, would be a shame to miss out on, on these uh, opportunities. Now, it's important to note that aside from being good opportunities because they're broad and they, it fits just about every uh, every kind of project, it's important to note that roughly 70% of all awards across the NIH uh, go to unsolicited or investigated initiated uh, solicit, uh, opportunities. So again, uh, don't miss out. And like I said, uh, you got a deadline coming up soon. Actually, no, not so soon for the SBRs. The next one is in. Uh, September, so you got a little bit of time for that, but uh, you know, don't wait too long to, uh, to get started because a lot of work involved. Let's take a little while now to focus on some case studies. Um, and I took some clients of ours where we uh, changed the names to protect the innocent, uh, and, and I took um, in three areas with, like, like you'll see, infectious disease, oncology, uh, and neurology. Uh, and what I want to show by, by these is just to give you an, a little idea of, of all the opportunities out there. Now, of course, each and every one of you has your own specific needs and your own specific uh, details of your project. So this is just to give you an example. And not every, not every solicitation that I mention that, that, that's relevant is mentioned in here. So, but it, I think it's just a, a good uh, idea to give you some opportunities, uh, ideas of opportunities that are out there. So, Let's look at our first case study. Again, name change to pro protect the innocent, and thanks to my colleagues, we came up with the name of this company called Back to the Future. So this is a U.S. company with 17 employees. They've raised $5 million in Series A. Uh, they're developing novel broad-spectrum antibiotics for the use in drug-resistant bacteria. They, they're at the point where they've identified the hit compound, uh, and now they're planning to initiate in vivo studies to determine the PK metabolism formulation and toxicity as part of IND enabling studies. So what do we have for them? We open the curtain. And again, these are not all of the opportunities that are out there, but these are some of, of the opportunities. Uh, there are actually many more that I didn't list, just they didn't fit on the slide. So first, the parent announcements, uh, they're all relevant here, SBIR, SDTR, the R21, and the R01, they're all relevant here. So just starting out, you don't even do any search, you already see uh, some good opportunities. But if we dig a little deeper, uh, as our analysts are so wonderful at doing, uh, we find from the from NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, uh, we find uh, the solicitation partnership for countermeasures against select pathogens. Uh, as you see, this is an R01, and you even have the, uh, this, the solicitation uh, number here, the RFA number, so if you want to look it up afterwards, again, not now, pay attention, but afterwards, if you want to look it up, you're, you're welcome to, and to read through to see uh, if it's appropriate for you. 
So this funding opportunity uh, it means to solicit research applications for milestone-driven projects focused on preclinical development of lead candidate countermeasures such as therapeutics, vaccines, and related technologies, or diagnostics against NIAID emerging infectious disease pathogens. Uh, these applications must include a product development strategy attachment and demonstrate substantive investment by at least one industrial participant. What you see here is it's really important. Every solicitation is different and unique. You've got to read through carefully. And here I'm just taking a, a very, very small part of it, but it's really important uh, to read them carefully. The budget for here, again, this is an R01, but you'll see the budget is, is quite different here. Uh, the budget for this has direct costs of up to $750,000 a year, not up to $500,000 like your typical R01. Uh, and applicants could also request an additional $300,000 for the first year of award for major equipment to ensure that research objectives can be met and biohaz can be contained. So that totals $1,050,000 in direct costs. So uh, not a bad, not, not a bad um, uh, bankroll there. Next due date for this again is not standard October 3rd. So you don't have to rush for June. You got October 3rd, but uh, again, don't put it off because time flies when you're having fun. Uh, and here, foreign institutions are eligible to apply. So we we welcome our uh, brothers and sisters from around the world uh, to to join us in this uh, opportunity. Next you have Usamaric, or Usamermic, I don't know why we call it Usamaric, but it's easier than Usamaric, which is the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command. Now here they have a BAA, a broad agency announcement for extramural medical research. Again, you see the solicitation number, uh, and um, you're welcome to, to look it up. A lot of, a lot of good information in the BAA, uh, so it's really important to read through it. So this BAA supports investigations focusing on development of novel medical countermeasures and innovative treatment approaches for multi-drug resistant organisms in combat wound infections and or biofilm formation, maintenance, or propagation. Here they don't give a specific budget. It should be commensurate with the nature and complexity of the proposed research. Uh, this is a rolling deadline and it, it closes at the end of their fiscal year, which is by September 30th. Again, you got a little bit of time. Uh, and once again, uh, foreign, uh, foreign non-US are welcome to, to apply. Next, you have the CDMRP. Again, you remember what it stands for? Okay, I'll tell you. Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. Uh, this is a development of preclinical testing of novel chemical classes, materials, biologics as potential therapeutics or prophylactics for wound infection and or biofilm formation the maintenance or propagation. Innovative treatment approaches are encouraged and preference will be given to approaches that address infections with one or more multi-drug resistant organisms. Uh, really interesting opportunity. And here you got funding of up to $2 million in direct course for up to three years. Again, another really great uh, opportunity. Uh, and last one for, for this case study, but again, not the last really relevant opportunity, is the Wellcome Trust. Now, like I said, while we do focus on U.S. sources, uh, the Wellcome Trust, um, somehow they snuck in. They're a great, uh, great foundation. Uh, they have lots of great opportunities. So they do have a translation fund here. Uh, and the aim of this uh, award is to develop innovative and groundbreaking new technologies in the bio biomedical area. The project must address an unmet need in healthcare or in applied medical research and offer a potential new solution and have a realistic expectation that the innovation will be developed further by the market. Uh, they want you to have already demonstrated proof of principle, supported by experimental data, uh, and it should bridge the funding gap and commercialization of new technologies in the biomedical area and uh, it should plan to take the product technology of intervention to a stage in which it's sufficiently developed to be attractive to another party. So they really want to see uh, someone who's going to make the most of their money. Uh, translation awards are general. They, they have them designed to be flexible, so it enables freedom to innovate and push the boundaries of current knowledge. Uh, they want to support individuals or teams through larger and bolder awards to accelerate product development. So the fund will consider applications that are either signal project or portfolio programs. 
Here, nice thing is the budgets are not limited. There are no deadlines until they decide that it's expired. Uh, and once again, uh, foreigners, uh, foreign institutions are, are welcome to apply. So that, that's our first uh, case study in infectious disease uh, with our company Back to the Future. Next, we have case study number two is Oncurable. I'm not sure if it should be with two C's, uh, Oncurable or Oncurable. Uh, but the important thing is it's not that it should be it should not be incurable. We want to make sure it is curable. So we have a company here, a small U.S. company with three co-founders who are also the three employees of the company. They've invested their own hard-earned money and they've raised an additional million dollars from friends and family. They're developing immunotherapy-based treatment for breast cancer. They are currently, they've identified the antibody and its safety and they're now initiating in vivo studies to determine the potency. And they're looking now to initiate in vivo studies to determine the efficacy of their treatment as part of their R&D enabling studies. So here we have, for our oncology, our cancer, we have the, the, big, uh, the big one here is the NCI, the National Cancer Institute from the NIH. Uh, first of all, you have the, the parent R01 uh, from... Uh, from the NIH, which the, uh, the NCI does participate in. Uh, next, we have the direct to phase two SBR grant to support biomedical technology development. Uh, that, by the way, if you want to mark down, I didn't have room on the slide to fit it, but that's PAR 14-088. So that's relevant for companies that demonstrated scientific and technical merit and feasibility the prototype stage of developing a biomedical technology that its commercial potential has R&D that's characteristic of phase one uh, SBIR projects. Uh, but here the direct to phase two grant mechanism is intended to facilitate SBIR type R&D to expand uh, uh, the opportunity for applicant uh, for small businesses and to enhance the pace of technology development and, and commercialization. Their budget, which normally doesn't, it should not exceed a million dollars for phase two awards, uh, but with appropriate justification, uh, Congress will allow awards to exceed these amount by up to 50%. So that gets you one and a half million dollars for phase two. Now it's also important to add that NIH has received a waiver from the Small Business Authority. Uh, then they can even exceed this hard cap of one and a half million dollars for specific topic, topics. So. Uh, I suggest uh, if you're in this field, uh, you know, look at this carefully, read through it, and um, you know, see if you fit, and, and maybe you can get even more money. As it is a million and a half dollars, not bad, you can get me even more money. Next deadline is September 5th, and um, this is only for uh, U.S. Uh, uh, institutions, organizations, businesses. Next, we have the NCI Clinical and Translational Exploratory Developmental Studies. This is the R21. Uh, this one is solicitation number PAR-16-176. By the way, if there's something that you missed here that I'm saying I'm talking too fast, first of all, you can listen to it uh, recording again, or even drop me an email, uh, and we can, uh, I can answer that email, or we can schedule a time to speak, and then see how things are relevant for you. This R21 is, is a little unique in that because the NCI does not participate in the parent R21, it does participate, it does in the R01, parent R01, but it does not, for whatever reason, I don't know, does not participate in the parent R21 with the other NIH institutes, so they have this, their own personal, private, exclusive parent R21 just from the NCI. And it supports the development of new exploratory research and cancer diagnosis, treatment, imaging, Symptom, symptom toxicity and prevention uh, clinical trials, correlative studies associated with cl clinical trials, novel cancer therapeutics, um, and on and on. And I suggest you, you look through, read through it uh, yourself. It's, uh, again, a lot of information there. The budget here is, is similar to the other R21s, uh, $275,000 or up to $275,000 for up to two years. Next due date is 
I think that's a mistake. It says here, which I brought down July 19th, but I do believe, I'd have to check on that. Um, I, yeah, let me check on that to be sure. I would think it's, uh, uh, it's the 16th, although it could be, it could be different. Uh, but again, if you want to check, PAR 16176. Next, we have the metabolic repro reprogram to improve immunotherapy, R01 uh, and R21. So the goal of these opportunities is to encourage R01 and R21 grant applications. The R21 for the earlier stage and the R01 for the more advanced projects. And uh, what we're trying to do is to generate a mechanistic understanding of the metabolic process that supports robust anti-tumor immune responses in vivo. Also to determine how the metabolic landscape of the tumor microenvironment affects immune uh, effector functions and uh, then use this information to manipulate or reprogram the metabolic pathways used by tumor, uh, the immune response, or both to improve cancer immunotherapy. Uh, now the R21 uh, again is up to 275 for two years uh, and then the R01 portion is up to half a million dollars a year for up to five years. This one does have standard due dates, so R01 June 5th, R21 June 16th, and foreigners are eligible. We got a CDMRP. Uh, thank you. We do. <laughs> I just got a note from one of my colleagues. Yes, in fact, it is June 19th. Interesting. So that uh, July. Oh, June 19th. Okay, June 19th. That's the, the previous one. That's the, uh, the clinical tr and translation exploratory developmental studies is June 19th. Thank you, Ms. Weiss. CDMRPs, um, again, uh, they have a peer-reviewed cancer research program or idea award with special focus. Uh, we're, we're getting a little tight on time, so I'm not going to go through it too carefully, but this is really a wonderful opportunity. Uh, nice thing about this is the pre-application is due June 8th, but it's only a pre-application. So while it's soon, it's a pre-application, one or two page. It's almost like a, a sales pitch where you want to get their interest, and then they invite you back uh, to submit a full application. The anticipated direct cost budgeted uh, for the entire period is up to $400,000 and foreign institutions are, are welcome and eligible. Uh, so the CDMRP and finally here we have the Breast Cancer Foundation which does not have a set form and um, it, it's kind of more fluid, not as, uh, as fixed in their whole process. Their typical awards are up to $250,000. So that, that takes care of our uncurable. And finally, our third case study is for a company we're calling Brain Freeze. This company is a U.S. company, once again, but like, you know, I hope you noticed that um, even though we're talking about three case studies with U.S. companies, uh, we simply did that because uh, a majority, probably 60-70% of our clients are U.S. companies, meaning that 30% uh, or so are, are non-U.S. Uh, but as you see from going through all these opportunities that uh, most of these solicitations are open uh, to non-U.S. Uh, so uh, don't let this uh, U.S. Um, company scenario throw you uh, or discourage you. So this company has 10 employees spun out, spun out of the university. They already raised $2 million from various local grants. And they're developing a small molecule drug to treat ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. They've already identified their hit compound and they plan to initiate uh, in vivo studies to determine the PK metabolism formulation toxicity of their compound as part of their R&D enabling studies. So what do we have for them? First of all, the SBIR, STTR, R21, R01 pair announcements. Again, all, all uh, wonderful opportunities, and you see even if you're non-US, you still have the R20 and R01 uh, pair announcements. Next, for uh, NINDS, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes, uh, they have a lot of uh, acronyms they use in different programs. So first they have this IGNITE program. IGNITE stands for Innovation Grants to Nurture Initial Translational Efforts. 
but how much tax money went to pay a guy to come up with these names? Guy or a gal, excuse me. So this program is part of a suite of programs to advance projects to the point where they can meet the entry criteria for the NANDS CREATE program. What does CREATE stand for? I wonder if anyone can guess. CREATE stands for Cooperative Research to Enable and Advance Translational Enterprise Program. Uh, and it's for biologics, biotechnology products, and it also for the BPN program, or BPN is Blueprint Neurotherapeutics Network, uh, and that's for small molecules or other translational programs. Now, the full name for this solicitation, which did not fit on this slide, uh, and I had a certain budget of slides I was allowed, so the full name of this solicitation is Pharmacodynamics and In Vivo Efficacy Studies for Small Molecules and Biologics Biotechnology Products. Say that one three times fast. So that number, maybe easier just to mark down the number, PAR1515-071. Uh, the budget here is $250,000 per year for the R21 uh, and $500,000 per year for the R33 phase. So the cumulative direct cost for this three-year project is up to $750,000. Again, that's in direct cost plus in direct costs. Next due date here is June 16th, followed by October 16th. And foreigners are welcome. Non-U.S. entities are welcome and invited to apply. Next we have the BPN, as we said, the Blueprint Neurotherapeutics Network. The BPN Small Molecule Drug Discovery and Development for Disorders of the Nervous System, that's a U44, it's a cooperative uh, opportunity solicitation. And what they're looking for is, is for applications from neuroscience investigators uh, seeking to support to advance the small molecule drug discovery and development projects into the clinic. Uh, those who are participating in the BPN, they receive funding for activities to be conducted in their own labs uh, and the opportunity to collaborate with NIH-funded consultants and contract research organizations, CROs. Um, they get to, to consult and work with uh, the CROs that specialize uh, in the uh, medicinal chemistry, pharmacokinetics, toxicology, formulation, development, chemical synthesis, uh, and under uh, GL, GMP and Phase one clinical testing. So it's really a great uh, combination of, of money as well as uh, professional help. Uh, typically, uh, this is up to $400,000 uh, total cost for Phase one and up to $4 million total cost for Phase two. meaning part of the money does go towards pay for using their, their their labs, but um, it's still quite a lot of money and quite uh, quite a, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, August 11th is the deadline for this, again non-standard, uh, but I'm sorry, unfortunately, foreign institutions are not eligible for this opportunity. But I think still you'll have to say, you have to admit that most of these opportunities uh, welcome our friends and neighbors from around the world. Next, you have opportunities for collaborative research at the NIH Clinical Center. This is again a U01. Uh, its uh, goal is to support collaborative translational research projects aligned with NIH efforts to enhance the translation of basic biological discoveries to clinical applications that improve health. Uh, here, the budget is uh, up to half a million dollars per year. Uh, and the next due date, this is a once a year opportunity, and the next due date is April 11th. So you have quite a while, but since it's only once a year, you do not want to miss out on this one. And foreign institutions are welcome. Neuronext is uh, the Neuronext Infrastructure Resource Access, which is an X01. This is different than some of the others because funds are not awarded here, but uh, if you do win this award, you're given access to the Neuronext infrastructure again. Uh, so uh, they're looking for, uh, for applications for exploratory clinical trials of investigational agents, whether it's drugs, biologic, surgical therapies, or device, that may contribute to the justification for and provide the data required for designing a future trial for biomarker validation studies or for proof of mechanism clinical studies. Diseases chosen by studies should be based on the NINDS 
strategic plan and clinical research. Uh, this has a, a deadline. Uh, they actually accept uh, applications on a continuous basis, but they have different cutoff points so that those received by July 12th are going to be reviewed by October, and foreign non-U.S. entities are welcome. We have the ALS uh, CDMRP here uh, for Research Program Therapeutic Development Award. Uh, anticipated uh, is, uh, for this is, is up to a million dollars. Now, this pre-application uh, deadline already passed in April, but I'm mentioning it anyway because uh, ALS is, is pretty popular, unfortunately, uh, and a uh, good chance that it will, uh, will show up in next year's round of CDMRPs. So uh, keep your eyes open. And finally here we're the ALS uh, Association. So they have a Translational Research Advancing Therapy for ALS, uh, also called Treat ALS. It's a drug development contract that offers up to half a million dollars. Uh, again, this was due in March. However, um, I guess unless uh, they, they succeed uh, right away in curing ALS, which I certainly hope they do, um, pretty sure you could expect a new solicitation to be announced uh, in a not too distant future. So that takes care of our third case study. So let's, uh, a few last few slides, let's talk a little bit about the NIH review process. Because what happens, you do all that work, you prepare these wonderful grant applications, you submit them. What happens? So it's a similar process with the NIH, NSF, DOD, and others as well. And what they're doing is they're reviewing, considering whether to fund your application what they look at really is the strengths versus the risk. You know, they, they want to help you, but they really want to help those who have the best chances of, of being successful. And the way they do this is they first look by two things. First, the responsiveness and the competitiveness. Are you responsive to the solicitation? Because no matter how good your science is, if you're not responsive to what they're soliciting, what they're interested in funding, they're not going to award you no matter how wonderful you are. And also, are you competitive? So when we talk about competitiveness, they look at five criteria, and they score you on these criteria, and uh, here's a case where it's good to get a lower score. They look at the significance of the research, how significant it is to public health. They look if it, it's innovative. Are you really going to make a change with your approach? The leadership, they want to see that you do have the right leadership in place. Is the PI and the key personnel, do they have the expertise and experience to successfully lead such a project? They also want to look at, they look at the environment, if it can support the work that you're proposing. Do you have the proper lab space to work? Or how are you going to get the work done? Uh, but ultimately what makes the difference between a good application that is not awarded and one that is awarded is your scientific approach, the milestones, the specific goals. And ultimately, we know that top-notch scientific approach is what wins awards. So just a little bit from a more uh, broad perspective, uh, let, let, let's take a quick look at uh, how we at Freeride, we take a systematic approach uh, to non dilutive funding uh, and how we uh, try to maximize your chance for award. Uh, first of all, you need to know the interest of the Institute. If you don't know what they're interested in, then you don't know what's on their agenda, then now, how do you know? How do you know who to go to, who to speak to? So that's an important part, and that's what our analysts do a great job in knowing and being in touch with the appropriate people to know what they're looking uh, and what they're interested in funding. Uh, you have to focus your project application because a focused application has a much higher chance of being favorably reviewed. Uh, you don't want to be proposed to come across as, uh, as being overly ambitious. You want to be focused on, on what you're uh, looking to accomplish. And with the budget, you want to ask for what's necessary. You don't want to ask for too much, because then they'll say you're just trying to make an extra buck. But you don't want to ask for too little, because they'll say you, you guys aren't realistic. You don't know what it takes uh, to, to fund your projects. So you've got to know to ask what's necessary. And it's also important to leverage on research collaboration. So in the case of STTR, you collaborate with academia and vice versa, or other industry partners in the case of SBIR. And, and each one brings a different set of skills to the table. 
when you need to, uh, you can take on consultants or statisticians or outsource work that you're less proficient in, in order to, to show that you guys have the expertise and the capability of, of getting the work done. It's also important, of course, to, to target the right neck mechanism. If you submit to, uh, to the wrong mechanism, the wrong source of money, then you know, it's, your application is going to basically uh, uh, be thrown out. Uh, there are different types of awards and different success rates. So that comes from experience. You, you know how to focus your, your work and your time in order to, to focus and, and direct your application. Uh, to where you have the best chances for, for being successful. And it's also very important, again, on, whether on your own or with us, to conduct a thorough, in-depth, and comprehensive strategic assessment. You need to know what's out there, what, what's available, what's relevant for you, uh, and, and uh, re really make the most of that. In, in, in general, in summary, you really need to create a multi-submission granting strategy. That's the way you maximize your chance for success. Now, we offer two core services, the strategic assessment and the project production process. So the strategic assessment is done by our analysts uh, where they understand your, your funding needs, outline the projects, uh, work to, to create the tasks that need to be done. Uh, they link your projects with the pockets of money, whether it's solicited opportunities or unsolicited opportunities, as we saw. And then they map out the relevant opportunities and create this multi-submission strategy. And then we work on the project production where we, we coordinate with you in order to get all of the information based on each solicitation guidelines. We create a first draft, we create a template of that solicitation for you and use the information you've given us to create the first draft, send it to you to fill in and answer uh, fill in missing information and then it's a back and forth uh, or ping pong process until everything is complete. We work together with you to get the information to to build the budgets, and then we put it all together in order to package it and make the most compelling, uh, coherent uh, grant application, and again, in order to maximize your chance for success. And it's important to know that when we work together with you, this is both done on an ongoing basis. If you just do a strategic assessment, and then that's it, there's always, you're missing out on opportunities because there's always new opportunities that are presented that, uh, uh, that uh, that come along throughout the, the time we're working together. So you want to constantly be looking at the at the landscape of opportunities. That brings us to uh, to an end of this uh, webinar, which I think I went a little bit over time. I apologize for that. Um, I was going to take questions, but I think I've run out of time. So you see my email address, Stuart at FreeMindConsultants with an S at the end dot com. Uh, please send me your questions. Again, I apologize uh, for not having time to answer them. We will, a bunch of us from the team here, will be at BIO uh, in San Francisco. Looking forward to that. Uh, so I uh, hope you could stop by our booth and say hello. We're actually also going to be raffling off a bottle of whiskey. And what more appropriate bottle to be raffling off than a bottle of Grant's whiskey, a one-gallon bottle. So uh, stop by. Say hello, enter our raffle, and um, I wish you the best of luck. So again, once again, thank you for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I welcome your feedback. Send me emails, uh, your comments. I will send out to all of you uh, the slide deck and a uh, link to the recording. And uh, look forward to being in touch with all of you. So until next time, I wish you either a good day or a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.